1997, Seinfeld was given a diagnosis. In one year, it would be dead. Uh, not Jerry Seinfeld, sorry, the, the show Seinfeld. Despite being offered $110 million, $5 million per episode, Jerry Seinfeld decided against making a season 10. So for the entirety of season 9, both Seinfeld the man and Seinfeld the show knew that it would soon be dead. Seinfeld is not the first nor the last show to know its death was coming. However, while most shows plan for the end, what makes Seinfeld special is that it never really started. No characters learned their lesson, barely anything changed, which begs the question. How do you finish a show whose plot never actually began? Television, like everything else, is deeply linked to our current world. Comedy, cartoons, even historical works and documentaries are viewed through the lens of the values and culture of where we are now. However, shows can differ on how linked to time they actually are. Genres like historical fiction go to great lengths to recreate whatever time period they took place in down to the tiniest of details. Some shows reject the past or the present and instead try to exist someplace in the future. Though despite being in a time period that doesn't even exist yet, these predictions of the future are almost always born out of the ideas we have now. Cartoons are the closest thing we have to timeless works, being able to explore the most absurd concepts we can imagine, but even then, there can always be some link to our world found. Even outside of what's actually explored in the shows, we're bound by the technology we actually had in any given era. From the moment we recorded a train for the first time, to tube television, to color TV. From the first time a stabilizer was used on camera, to the awkward age of special effects, to the grainy look of the 80s, and on and on. Even without actively thinking about it, our brains can tell just about when a film or show was made, defined not just by the society it came from, but from what that society actually had access to. And among all of these different genres, from fantastical to deadly serious, sitcoms are some of the most tied to their time. Situational comedies can almost be seen as the opposite to sketch comedy. Sketch comedy shows have a rotating cast of actors that show us quick, snappy looks into a new world. They swap to window after window, popping in just long enough for us to get the joke, but absolutely no longer. Once the punchline ends, so does our view into that world. However, just like sketch comedy, the origin of sitcoms exists as cheap and effective entertainment. Among the first sitcoms was the nationwide sensation I Love Lucy. Filmed in front of a live audience, the show relied on the same couple of sets being used over and over again, and despite the setup being relatively cheap, the show was massively successful. Jump just 20 years later, and MASH was one of the largest shows on television, with its series finale still being the most watched episode premiere in television history. And yet, despite the setting for the sitcom being the Korean War, our show takes place in a small army hospital. In the middle of a constantly moving battle, we get a window into a place that mostly stays the same. Just like most of our everyday lives, we see the same places and people. Their adventures might be wacky or a little over the top, but they're more grounded than the war movies of the same and current era. There's a comfort we get in watching sitcoms, forming bonds with TV's closest thing to an average person. However, because of this, because these shows are meant to showcase some version of everyday life, as time keeps moving forward, an existential problem starts to lurk. When we watch a show like The Roadrunner, every single episode is self-contained. It follows a basic formula. The coyote tries to catch the Roadrunner in question and fails in some humorous way. You don't need to have seen a single other episode of The Roadrunner show to understand what's happening in this one. Let's compare this to, I don't know, Breaking Bad. If you were to randomly catch the last 10 minutes of the season 2 finale ABQ, you might be wondering who this sweaty guy is with a headset on and oh, what the fuck? The Roadrunner Show and Breaking Bad are the two sides of TV show structure. On one end, you have episodic television, where the start and end point connect in a circle. The episode begins and ends at the same point, the coyote not catching the Roadrunner, and the plot of the episode only takes a short detour away from that point. Breaking Bad, on the other hand, is what we call a serial TV show. Every single episode progresses from point A to a different point B. Each of these episodes connect together, one after the other, until it eventually reaches an endpoint. But the important part is, no matter if it's one episode, a season, or even the entire series, by the end of it, there's a significant amount of change. 
Breaking Bad, after all, is a show about chemistry. These terms, episodic and serial, are two points of a spectrum where many shows, especially lately, land closer to somewhere in the middle. Most often called hybrids, these shows combine the circle of episodic shows and the line of serial ones. While each and every episode has an easy to understand, mostly self-contained story, there's events along the entire series trajectory that slightly change what that point A in the circle actually is. For example, in The Office, every season and the entire series itself has some overarching plot lines. The most famous, of course, is Jim and Pam's will-they-won't-they -they relationship. First, they're both interested, but Pam's engaged to Roy, then Jim kisses Pam, but she stays with Roy, so then Jim goes to a different branch, but then he comes back, but he's dating Karen, and then he finally dumps Karen, and after three entire seasons, Jim and Pam finally get together. This plotline didn't need to take 50 episodes, but most episodes didn't have anything change. Combine this with every other plotline in The Office, and you have a show that remains mostly the same, but is always just barely shifting its dynamic. When it comes to the realm of sitcoms, The Office and Parks and Recreation and others are on the more serial side of things, but almost every single sitcom rests on the episodic half of this spectrum, because our lives do too. Similar to us, most days for these characters don't radically change their lives. They go to the same places and interact with the same people, and most changes are relatively small and subtle. Except for that time Seinfeld killed off a character, but she deserved it, honestly. But lying in this episodic show structure is a deadly sickness for sitcoms. Lying in that point A, that dot that the entire base of the show is set in, is a time capsule. The show's setup is trapped in the year the show was made. Its values and characters and setting are stuck in that exact moment, and unlike these shows, society is always changing. After enough time passes, the mirror that the show puts up to reflect our world slowly gets less and less aligned. And while you'd think hybrid shows would do a better job of keeping up with the times, they have their own huge set of issues they need to take care of. Firstly, while hybrid shows change more, the amount of narrative arcs they set up near the start of the show are inherently limited. And with these limited arcs, they can only go on for so long. Eventually, the couple needs to get together. Eventually, after that, they need to get married. And once they get married, well, that's it. That crucial and sensual plotline is done. And yet, the show has to keep going. Hybrid sitcoms are stuck between a rock and a hard place, between staying still and moving forward. It's a fine balancing act that every show eventually falls off of. All of these problems with all of these structures make it so that most successful TV shows have a surprisingly short lifespan. But not all of them. When looking through a list of the longest living TV shows, a pattern quickly starts to emerge. The ability to reincarnate. Saturday Night Live has been around for 46 years, but rather than being a consistent show with a cast and locations, it's almost more comparable to a format. It's a nighttime sketch comedy show with a new celebrity guest every Saturday. The writing and acting staff are constantly shifting with the times, allowing it to stay present by not having anything from the past weighing it down. It's more of a vessel than a show. When it comes to actual plot-driven shows, the idea of reincarnation is occasionally quite literally in the structure itself. Doctor Who is an alien who looks human and travels through time to battle evil or discover stuff or something. And despite the Doctor being technically one consistent character, it dies over and over again and reincarnates as a new Doctor, being able to update their show over and over again to match with the times. Similar to James Bond, the person is less important than the idea, and so the role gets filled generation by generation. There are even soap operas that are literally multi-generational, following the lives and sons and daughters of a family line over the course of thousands and thousands of episodes. However, among this list of generational works lies one show that has refused to go down that route, the route of reincarnation, for the better or the worse. Seinfeld willingly died at the end of season 9, but many would argue that The Simpsons died at the end of season 9 too, even if unintentionally. From around season 10 and beyond, The Simpsons has been in an era that's commonly dubbed the Zombie Simpsons. The show originally existed as a counterculture sitcom from the 90s, but its rapid explosion of popularity made it far too lucrative to end. So, as time went on, as decades and decades and decades went on, 
The mirror shifted from society to itself, to parodies of itself, to absolutely nothing, spiraling endlessly into a formulaic bastardization of pop culture and everything it originally hailed against. It's gone far beyond beating a dead horse. It's a horse that's hooked up to machines, being forced to dance for its makers, begging desperately for its death. Unlike The Simpsons, most shows see the inevitable. The Office, near the end of its life, was functionally falling apart. Near the end of season 7, after the wedding and the other wedding and all of the proposals, Steve Carell, aka Michael Scott, decided to leave the show. Issue is, he was kind of the core of the entire show. Beyond this point, despite a real effort, some brand new and pretty funny characters, and some real shining moments, The Office was on its last legs. So after 5 Emmys, 188 episodes, and 9 long seasons, it decided to end in style. In what's best described as an over 2 hour long 3 part finale, all the last remaining threads of the show get tied together in a pretty little knot. Dwight becomes a regional manager and decides to get married, all the characters reunite including Michael Scott and share their thoughts on the documentary that served as the reason for the show's existence. It's grand, heartfelt, and despite the rough final seasons, fans of the show absolutely loved it, being one of the highest rated episodes of The Office of all time. Seinfeld, on the other hand, the final episode starts with NBC executives calling Jerry Seinfeld, uh, the Jerry in the show, that his plot for an edgy sitcom named Jerry is being considered for production after years of sitting in a pile of other ignored pilots. This was probably the closest thing to a recurring plotline in the show, so fans were expecting some type of actual ending. But as the show goes on, the group repeatedly avoids it. Jerry and George plan to move to California to make the show, but only for a while. The private jet they take almost crashes, but doesn't. And after managing to avoid death, the group lands in a small town where they get arrested for being assholes. And for the next 30 minutes, the entire remaining runtime of the show, the last anyone will ever see of these people, our main cast gets berated in court by every single person they did wrong over the 9 season run of the series. After being shown without a shadow of a doubt of their guilt, of being assholes, all four are sentenced to prison, but only for a year. After that year, Jerry and George will probably move to California and make Jerry, but it's something we'll never see resolved. The final scene of the show, of this entire nine season show, is Jerry, George, Elaine, and Kramer being taken to the cell and having one final exchange. It's a conversation about jacket buttons, the exact same one as the very first episode of the series. See, now to me, that button is in the worst possible spot. Really? Oh, yeah. The second button is the key button. It literally makes or breaks the shirt. Look at it, it's too high. It's in no man's land. And as it pans out, we realize that this is the death of Seinfeld. People hated this ending, of course, because in truth, it's not an ending at all. Throughout the entire episode, no closure is given to the watcher. There are no deaths or grand adventures or truly anything special. Any actual ending is one we'll never get to see. And on top of all of that, we're promised that this will all repeat over and over again. Once Jerry and George move to California, the show will likely be a success. It'll go on for about 9 seasons before being given a 10th. Despite being offered $110 million, $5 million per episode, he would decide against it. And so, Jerry would be faced with a problem. For the entirety of season 9, both Jerry the Show and Jerry the Man would know that it would soon be dead. So, how do you end a show that never even started? According to Jerry Seinfeld, you don't. You simply close our window into that world, as the cycle of sitcoms is promised to repeat in stasis forever. A never-ending capsule into a time long past. Thank you, and have a nice day. Thank you for watching. This video was sort of a spiritual successor to my last video about the out of bounds in video games, so if you liked this, you'll probably enjoy that. If you enjoy this or that or anything else, I encourage you to subscribe. I work incredibly hard on the videos I make. If you want to support me further, I have a Patreon. For only $2, you can help support my efforts to make quality over quantity videos about any sort of topic I find interesting. 
It only pays out when I release a video, and you get access to a direct chat with me and other patrons, commentaries on the themes and technical details of all of my videos, a custom Patreon bowl in my Discord server, join link below, and any sort of sneak peeks I might release about upcoming content. Just recently, I also added a bunch of goals to meet with fun rewards in the future. Trust me, you won't regret it. That being said, I hope you enjoyed, and have a great day.